Hello and uh, welcome to this webinar on what is Network as a Service, uh, July 19th. Um, my name is Paul McGuinness. I am Head of Solutions for Europe at Megaport. And I'm going to take you through the session today. It's an introductory session on what is Network as a Service. And what we're going to cover today is what is NAS or Network as a Service. We'll have a look at how that differs from uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. And then we'll look into what is driving its adoption, um, how it's implemented, the benefits that users of network as a service see, the use cases, and then the future of NAS as well. Um, so as we go into this session, it'll take about 30 minutes for this introductory session, but let's kick off with how it differs from IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS, or Infrastructure as a Service, Platform as a Service, and Software as a Service. So first off, um, Infrastructure as a Service, it really provides you with those basic building blocks that you need uh, if you're going to use cloud-based IT. And this could be in a hyperscaler in public cloud, or it could be something that you're doing in private cloud as well. And it's really giving you those building blocks like networking, compute, and storage and it gives you full flexibility of how to deploy your applications and everything that you need on top of the networking compute and storage. So full access to you, but there's more work involved, but it allows you to achieve you know, everything that uh, uh, you may wish to achieve with an infrastructure as a service play, but you don't have to worry about the basic building blocks. With platform as a service, you have to focus more on the management of your applications and your data. The platform as a service provider takes care of the hardware and operating systems while you can just look after um, your apps and you don't have to worry about the complexity of the underlying infrastructure and the operating systems that are involved there. Some examples might be um, AWS, uh, Elastic Beanstalk, uh, Heroku, or IBM Cloud Foundry or Platform as a Service. For software as a service, you don't have to worry about any of the maintenance operation of the infrastructure or of the applications because that's all taken care uh, for you by the software as a service provider. People who consume software as a service are usually doing that on a subscription basis, but not always, but that's usually the model. And examples might be uh, Slack or um, Microsoft Office, Gmail. All of these platforms uh, extract away the complexity so that you don't have to worry about it, but it still gives you some controls over the way that it's set up and the way that it integrates with other systems. But all of that is typically driven through you know, a graphical user interface. So looking at network as a service, this is where you're going to a network as a service provider and instead of you building your own network, you're allowing the network as a service provider to look after the full lifecycle management of the network infrastructure, including the network management, software, licensing, all of the hardware and the connectivity um, that is part and parcel of a network as a service. So all that you have to do is go and consume this NAS environment and you can build and manage what you need uh, through the different interfaces that are provided to you. So it really simplifies your model. It's typically on a subscription basis, but it can be on uh, you know, a longer term subscription as well as necessary. So what services can you deploy on network as a service? You can do pretty much everything that you can do if you built your own network today. Um, you can do it faster and you don't have to worry about that underlying infrastructure. So for example, you can do virtual routing. You can have connectivity to cloud. That's private connectivity to cloud. You can do multi-cloud. So if you're going to more than one cloud provider, you can do that privately. You can do virtual firewalling. And that would, could be an element that you spin up immediately and start using. And you can also procure internet services and internet exchange services as well through network as a service provider. And that's just naming a few, there are other things as well. So where can you deploy these things? Well, 
essentially you can do it globally anywhere the network as a service provider uh, gives you that access. It also allows you to build up an ecosystem of your own. So you can join a network as a service provider uh, yourself and then potentially ask your partners or uh, other companies that you collaborate with to join the same network as a service provider and then connect privately over that NAS environment, over a software-defined network. You can do hybrid cloud networking as well. So involving connectivity to multiple clouds and connectivity back to on-premise data centers for private cloud as well. And really mix and match the, the type of environment that you need and build that in a resilient way as well. And then of course you can connect from data centers to other locations around the world. Um, also from branches, potentially over the internet or over private interfaces, and then you know headquarters and any other location that you might need. So what's driving this adoption? Well, we've actually been looking at some research from um, a couple of different uh, sources from ESG research from 2022, from Flexera 2022 and Checkpoint Research 2023, and looking at common challenges that organizations have been experiencing when connecting to cloud. Um, network costs are obviously something that um, are you know, top of mind. A lot of the decisions about going to cloud are often made by you know, the, the finance organization. And organizations have been looking at you know, reducing uh, their costs where necessary. And what they find is often, if you want to go privately to the cloud, the costs can be prohibitive in, in certain ways. Um, network complexity can also be a big factor whereby um, you know, 60% of organizations are or will use more than four cloud providers. So there's lots of different use cases, whether it is, you know, IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS. Companies are really mixing up the usage of cloud and then managing private connectivity to multiple clouds is, uh, is um, more and more of a challenge. Um, network performance is always something top of mind. How do I design my network with um, resilience in mind? How do I make sure that I have redundant connections at every aspect, you know, between locations and connecting into the cloud providers as well? Um, as more organizations are moving into the cloud, we can see here 57% are, are, you know, moving more to cloud with more cloud adoption. Costs, again, are something that has to be considered when going into the cloud. So the, the organizations in uh, these surveys have said that they are now looking at the optimization of cloud costs. So uh, quite often organizations will move to the cloud quite quickly and then uh, look at cloud optimization uh, later than that. So you need a good cloud center of excellence to look after how the governance is put in place and how those costs are maintained and uh, kept under control. And then finally, security risks as well. So it's always been a concern. It will be into the future, um, being able to protect your data to and from the cloud. These are all things that you see you know, on the slide that network as a service can help with. It can give you private connectivity to get to cloud, to get between clouds, and also to control your costs and look after network performance as well. So what makes um, network as a service different when you compare it to traditional network connectivity? The first one is pricing. So with network as a service, you're paying for what you use. You, there's typically no setup fees. You can just provision the services uh, that you need when you need them. Um, you know, compared to a lot of traditional providers where you're uh, often locked into a long-term uh, uh, contract and there's often a lot of expensive setup costs there as well. So this ties into, you know, network as a service often being month by month or hour by hour, and you only go into a longer term if it suits your needs, whereas the traditional networks will often need that long-term contract. And then if you try to change um, the flexibility of that long-term contract, change data rates, that is uh, another negotiation that you have to enter into. With network as a service, it's real-time provisioning, it's elastic capacity, turn up and down, 
the data rates and turn on and off the connectivity to suit um, your needs, to suit your levels of resilience that you need as well. And then the, the NAS providers, and I'll touch on this a, a few times, the NAS providers have already created the connectivity to lots of third parties, including all of the major cloud providers in many different locations globally. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then it's it's really easy to use. If you're using uh, a NAS environment, it's typically simplified. It gives you full power and control over many of your network activities, but it is simplified. So if you're coming from, uh, let's say, a cloud environment and you're not a networking expert, uh, using network as a service can be uh, a benefit for you without needing to have a uh, huge amount of expertise in the networking area. Okay, so let's have a look at how it's implemented. So essentially, network as a service lives inside data centers. It's typically deployed in lots of different locations globally. The network as a service provider themselves will make up a typical kit list in core data centers and edge data centers, and then they'll be able to deploy those quickly in different locations. And typically these locations are then connected over resilient fabric type networks. So the benefit of being in multiple data centers means that uh, customers have the choice then where to connect onto the network as a service provider and to choose the entry point that they want and suits their needs. It also allows them to connect data centers together if they wish to do so. So different DC operators, they can be connected based on the requirements of the end user themselves. And what this means is when you look at a map of a, you know, a typical NAS provider, they'll typically have major metros, especially commercial metros around the world, lit up with their network. So that means a global deployment that means that the NAS provider has to go through you know, regulatory compliance in each of these countries and get approval before they can deploy there. And then within each metro or each city, you'll have potentially many different locations to connect into as well, because there'll many, be many different DCs or data center operators um, that will be popped by the network as a service provider. So that gives you options within a city and typically the NAS provider will be in the popular data centers. And typically they will also be in the data centers where the, the major cloud providers are connected as well. And being in those data centers means that the NAS provider has got the connectivity to AWS, to Google, to Microsoft Azure, to Oracle, IBM, et cetera. That's already in place. So customers don't have to worry about that. Private connections are already there and users can just connect to the network as a service network and consume as required. So how do they actual, actually consume the services? It's typically through a portal. So using a graphical user interface through a portal, users can go in and consume the services. They can create new services, connect them together, connect them to third parties, connect them to the cloud, and then they can monitor those services, look at uh, the logs, look at traffic um, statistics and details, and then manage the life cycle of those connections through the portal interface. And then most network as a service providers also provide an open API so that you can consume the services through API if you want to use uh, infrastructure as code. And you can also use other tools like Terraform to do that as well. So what about the benefits of using network as a service? Well, I touched on a few of these already, but really, you know, it's on demand scale. You can build what you need when you need it. And you're doing that using the simple tools that are provided to you. So a simple to use uh, portal, or more advanced tools in uh, infrastructure as code. Um, the network is typically private and secure so that you're jumping onto a private network and it allows you to reach high data rates, 10 gig or even interfaces of 100 gigabits per second. 
and that allows you to achieve those higher data rates uh, between locations or into the cloud or to your partners. And having that on a private network means that um, security is uh, easier to achieve um, by traversing a private network. And if you need to uh, encrypt your data on that private network, you can do so as well. Many NAS providers will provide you with the ability to do that, uh, the, the tooling and the right software models to do that as well. Um, and then it's scalable on demand. You right size the connectivity for what you need. You can typically turn it up and down, turn things on and off and provision as you need. Um, many uh, architectures within, or I should say all architectures within a network as a service are up to the end user. So if the end user doesn't want resilience, you don't have to deploy that. If you want to have a resilient network, you can typically work with um, uh, network architects or work with your provider, and they will get you a design that is guaranteed to be resilient with no single points of failure. Um, like I said before, network as a service is typically deployed on a global basis, so you can access in many locations globally, and you're paying for what you need. So let's look at um, a few use cases to try and show you what um, can be achieved with NAS. So like I said, the cloud providers are typically all connected already in many different regions globally. So these are connected over the software defined network that the network as a service provider is using. And then a user could choose to come to a data center and meet the network as a service provider. Now there are ways to jump onto the, the NAS network with internet connectivity as well, um, but if a user comes to a data center, they can meet the NAS network there. And then from there, they can connect to all of the clouds that they need at high data rates over a private interface. So for AWS, that would be Direct Connect. For Microsoft Azure, that would be an express route. For Google Cloud, that would be um, a Google Cloud partner interconnect. If you need resilience, then maybe you connect in another data center or in a different zone in the first DC and you can come up with some resilience options there to all of the clouds. And again, that would be resilient on the, the A end on the left in the data center and also resilience in the cloud side as well, because all of these cloud providers provide redundant interconnects in the metros where they provide these private interconnect options. Okay, so what about um, if you don't want to connect from um, a data center or a non-premise network? Well, in this case, you can spin up a virtual router in a location that suits you in a major metro globally. And in this case, you spin up the virtual router to meet the size requirements, the throughput requirements that you need. And then you do virtual connections from that virtual router into the cloud interfaces that I spoke about before. So in this type of environment, you can go cloud to cloud with the virtual router, um, achieving high data rates, and this is 100% private connectivity. So you're not going over the internet. It's all private from one cloud to another. And typically the, the cloud on-ramps and the virtual router will be all located within the same data center location. And that will give you low latency cloud connectivity um, that you can achieve and spin up by yourself. So all of these types of things can be spun up by the user without actually talking to the NAS provider. You log in, uh, spin up the virtual router, create the connectivity under your control. Again, if you need a resilience option there, you can spin up another virtual router in another location and everything will be entirely uh, independent and redundant. And then finally, bringing these things together, you've got uh, data center connectivity and then you've got virtual routing layer in here as well. And this is where you're, you're doing maybe hybrid multi-cloud. All of the cloud to cloud traffic will just go through the virtual routers. And then anything that needs to go back to the data center can do that as necessary. And this would be a, a redundant model. It also provides you with a little bit of sheltering um, of your data center activities. Um, instead of uh, having all of the BGP sessions that are required from the cloud providers going back to your equipment in the DC, you can uh, terminate those connections on the virtual routers themselves and uh, 
making the, the connection back to on-premise a lot simpler. Okay, so let's look at what um, some of the feedback of uh, users' experience of using network as a service is. So the first one here is about eliminating uh, VPNs while directly connecting to AWS spot instances on demand, reducing cloud egress fees by half and driving lower cloud costs. So the spot instances need to be consumed at a certain time, uh, typically maybe at high data rates. So in this example, you know, instead of trying to, to do that over the internet, uh, the users could connect using um, uh, high data rates on demand for that. The second one here is about uh, automated multi-region, multi-cloud network deployment via APIs. So like I mentioned earlier, you can do all of your deployment through APIs um, and, and quickly spinning up maybe uh, backup services or scaling up data rates as necessary quickly. Um, then we've got an example of uh, you know large data uh, big data in uh, SAP HANA with uh, many different systems in uh, private cloud there. Number four is about connecting seven unique data center operators around the globe on demand through a single platform. So that's about having the different data center operators who don't typically interoperate with each other and being able to connect those together over a network as a service. So again, all under your control through the, the graphical user interface. And then uh, number five is about deploying a global network supporting a cloud center of excellence that connects 9,000 plus engineers in three regions to three clouds in under a week. So you can see the scale that can be achieved in different regions around the world to different clouds at high speed. It really is um, you know, a lot of power that the user has under their control. And then finally, um, an example of a user reducing latency by half, quadrupling the bandwidth at, while at the same time lowering costs. You know, in that case, maybe uh, reducing the amount of MPLS connections that you might have or private loops, and then being able to have more bandwidth with lower latency um, with lower overall costs. Okay, so what really does it look like if someone deploys a, a network in a region or globally? Now, this is an, an example of a, a global deployment, but this could be you know, within Europe, within North America and Canada, uh, or Mexico, for example. Um, in this example, in North America, we've got a virtual router, we've got two clouds, Microsoft Azure and Oracle Cloud. And we've also got multiple data centers in different parts um, of the US and, and one connecting from uh, Mexico as well. In Europe, there's just a single data center location connecting into multiple clouds, in, including a Google. And then over in Singapore, there's an element there that's connecting in uh, branches. It's connecting to AWS and Azure, and then it has connectivity across to uh, Brisbane in Australia and across to Tokyo there as well. And then all of these elements are connecting together over a global backbone. And that global backbone is also provided by the network as a service provider. And again, it is a private backbone. It's not going over the internet. So all of this communications can be kept away from the internet, can be kept secure and can be encrypted indeed um, as necessary. But this is just kind of a, a simplified picture of what a, a global deployment might look like. Okay, so what about um, the future of network as a service? We'll just talk about a, a few different things and we'll talk about the subject of SASE. So that's secure access service edge. And this is a, a term that was coined by Gartner, who basically has come up with a, an architectural model that is around networking and security and how they should work together to create this architectural model. So uh, SD-WAN is made up of lots of different elements with five core elements and then lots of other pieces as well, recommendations. And one of those five core elements includes an SD-WAN type environment. So software-defined, a wide area network, being able to connect over a particular underlay and offer a security overlay on top of that. Typically, SD-WAN is deployed across the internet, but it can easily be deployed on top of a network as a service provider as well. The SD-WAN network doesn't really care if it's, if it's internet or network as a service. So you can go for a sort of a double layer of 
privacy network as a service underneath, and then an SD-WAN layer on top as well. So many SD-WAN networks will host SD-WAN hubs for you, and they can take one of your SD-WAN elements, host that for you, and then allow you to connect onto the network as a service, and then from there onto anything else that you need to connect to globally across that NAS provider. Other things that they can do as well include secure web gateway hosting, uh, firewall hosting on the, the NAS network as well. And then, uh, of course, another hot topic is uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So some, you know, there has been great inroads into using machine learning and many network as a service providers do use machine learning in their networks today and making a move towards artificial intelligence. And the areas that this has been used in is mainly around a few different parts, one of them being finding remedies to issues quickly. So being able to find the root cause of an issue and just tell the user what the actual issue is instead of giving them lots of different alarms, um, uh, narrowing that down and providing the, the answer that the network operator wants to know about. Um, the other thing that's quite common today is, is around real-time provisioning. So allowing machine learning to understand your network needs, understand how you use the network, your typical trends, and then right-sizing the network for you. It could just give you an alarm and say, you know, you need you could reduce your network bandwidth by 50% and make some cost savings, or you know, with machine learning and some intelligence in there, it could actually make that change for you. And that, of course, in turn, does that provisioning in real time, and then that allows you to control costs and keep your costs down. Another area is really around the rise of network function virtualization. Now, if you wanted to take a, a, a virtualized function, like a, a virtual router or firewall, you could get your own hardware. You can deploy that anywhere you like in a, in a data center or, or in your headquarters. And you could um, put that virtualized software on top of that. But you're still looking after an appliance and you're still um, maintaining a footprint in a data center when potentially you don't need to. Now, you could also deploy that inside the cloud in the major cloud providers, or you could deploy that on a network as a service provider as well. So what we're seeing is a, a big trend in virtualizing these elements. Instead of buying physical boxes for your routers, for your firewall appliances, we're seeing more and more users moving towards a network function virtualization and basically using the software versions that are made available by the router vendors, by Cisco, by Fortinet, by Palo Alto, you know, these, these are software versions that are the equivalent of the software version that runs on an appliance, but it's now available for you to use in, in different ways. And it comes with all of the features that you, you know and love from the appliance environment. So as more and more users move to cloud, they also move um, to more of a virtual model. And that kind of brings us to virtual connectivity hubs. So if I just blow up one of these virtual connectivity hubs to be a little bit bigger, a virtual connectivity hub can be made up of many different elements. In this example, we've got a, a, an SD-WAN network connecting in through some SD-WAN hubs and going to a firewall layer and then going to multi-cloud. Okay, now this could be a virtual routing layer in there. It could be connecting from data centers. But the trend that we're seeing in the network is where enterprises are creating virtual connectivity hubs in typically a metro or across a few locally deployed metros, deploying that in a resilient way, and then using that in a copy and paste way in different locations around the world. And then they're using the network as a service provider's network to connect these hubs together. Okay, so that's a private connectivity between private virtual connectivity hubs that gives them all of the routing capabilities that they need, the firewalling, resilience, um, onboarding of SD-WAN, a private network from A to B, and then all of the cloud access that they need at high data rates. Okay, so like we say, this is, this is really what we're seeing a lot of in the market, uh, the virtual connectivity hubs. 
Okay, so um, that concludes this Megaportal Live session. We've got two more coming up. So we're introducing uh, multi-cloud connectivity with David Sloan on August 24th. So there will be uh, registration out for that shortly. And that will be an intermediate session covering the private connectivity options into AWS, Azure, and, and GCP. And this is a really good session if you want to get to know about AWS uh, Direct Connect and the gateways that are involved there, you know, Microsoft Azure Express route and some of the details around that and things that you should know. It's a really good uh, step into the cloud and the connectivity models there. And the other um, Megaportal Live session that we have is with Gary Taylor, and that is diversifying your uh, Google uh, Cloud Platform landing zone uh, infrastructure. And Gary will have a guest speaker from Google on that session, and that is an intermediate advanced session covering Google Cloud Platform uh, landing zone design and connectivity. And actually, Gary um, has been answering your questions. I, uh, uh, I forgot to mention at the start, but um, Gary has been uh, answering your questions here in the background. So uh, keep them uh, coming uh, through on that. So please uh, sign up for these. You'll see um, a notification going out for these shortly. You'll be able to sign up for both um, uh, at the same time. And then there'll be uh, more in the series after these as well. So uh, that's it for this session. Thank you for attending. My name is Paul McGuinness. My contact details are at the bottom. I'd love to hear from you if you have any uh, feedback or if you want to talk over any of the items that we've, we've covered here today. But um, with that, we'd um, just like to say, uh, wishing you a good rest of the day. And thank you again for attending.